What's up guys, it's your boys Wilkie back with another crime talk, crime, all the above kind of video. And we're going to be taking a look at the Casey Anthony or the Kaylee An uh, Anthony case. This one really, I remember it vaguely, but I remember it. I was so upset because of this little three-year-old girl that didn't even get a chance to blossom or become a woman and just overall enjoy life was taken away from the world and everything pointed towards her mother. Now I, I remember it was like 31 days. She finally admitted that um, her daughter was missing. There was a whole bunch of evidence of chloroform and duct tape. And, and for some reason she's free. I apparently the jury was like, yep, we don't have enough evidence. And, and now there was a whole bunch of things that she was blaming the father. And then her apparently, uh, Casey Anthony's dad was involved and there's a ton of <coughs> ton of information that we need to go over before we really dive down this rabbit hole of the Casey Anthony case. So what I want you guys to do is grab a chair, get ready, subscribe for all of this stuff when it comes to all things nerdy and crime talk. Make sure you guys are subscribing by hitting that wiper icon down at the bottom right. Hit the bell icon next to it. So when I do post videos like this one, you guys will get that little ring notification that's a Wookiee myself has posted that video. You guys can watch, comment, like, and share. And again, thank you guys so very much for the love and support. We just hit 33K. It's all because of you guys. So make sure you guys do keep doing what you guys are doing. Tell your friends, tell your family, or anybody you guys know, and we'll continue growing together. Because once we get to that 50K mark, one of you lucky people are going to get yourself a MetaQuest 3 virtual reality headset, and everybody can use it. Anybody can use it. Any All, all genders, all uh, uh, ages, it's it's for everybody, and it's super fun. I have one myself, and I think you guys would enjoy it. But when we get to 100,000 subscribers, we're going to get to uh give away two more so subscribe it's free it's easy and there's tons to enjoy also we're gonna be taking a look at the anna elise times 10 to life um i love this channel i've watched a lot of her videos i definitely enjoy it her voice is very soothing i think um but definitely go over to her channel give her some love because she's the one that's presenting this we're just giving our two cents and a reaction so without further ado Many of you guys are probably aware that there is a new three-part documentary on Peacock regarding Casey Ooh. Anthony. I need to go watch that. In this documentary, she gives her first on-camera interview in 10 years where she gives her version of events and her story, her truth behind the infamous case of her daughter, Kaylee Such Anthony. Such a beautiful little girl. Now, it's pretty interesting so because she retells a lot of stuff that we already had heard in the trial but she also drops quite a few new bombshells and i'll be honest casey's latest interview seems to have dredged up a number of inconsistencies between her side of the story and the one that much of the public saw back in 2011 during the trial i myself watched all three episodes although i had initially told myself i wasn't going to i did and I identified quite a few inconsistencies. As oh, I'm going to watch it tonight when I am done with our live video um, or live stream today. I'm definitely going to watch that on Peacock. Well, so today we are going to talk about all of those. And guys, I'm heated. I am heated. I was literally shaking as I was watching the first episode. Oh, boy. And I want to just remind you, this is just my opinion. So research the case for yourself. Form your own conclusions. This so for those haters out there, back off. Okay. These are our opinions. It's for educational purposes. We're not in the court system. We don't state that we are professionals. People apparently think that I'm a professional. I am not a professional. I'm just using my opinions, my theories, my decisions to make a, an assumption. Is it correct? Who knows? But again, I'm not stating and anywhere, anywhere on anything that I'm a professional or I'm a crime investigator um, expertise. So I want to make that very clear. This video is just going to be my takeaways and my opinion on this case, but we're going to go through all those discrepancies. So guys, let's jump right in. Let's jump in. Sent to life with Annie Elise. Start right now. Now here's what I want to do. Before we start the video, going through everything she said and some of these things, I want you to go to the comment section really quick 
and make a comment at the start of this video. Tell me if you believe in this moment that Casey Anthony is guilty or not guilty. Guilty. Then at the end of this video, I want you to come back and comment again and tell me if your opinion has changed or if you still feel the same way. Just curiosity. If it loads, how is a jury Casey not guilty is? Yeah, see? Let her walk. Let her walk. Let her walk. How can they give her not guilty? Not guilty. Get the Dude, yeah, she's going <clears> to... <throat> I say she's guilty. What do you guys think? This can be if you've watched the documentary already or not. Just let me know. I'm just curious to see how you feel now and how you're going to feel at the end of this video. And if it changes, and maybe it won't. I doubt so the it. documentary was filmed back in February of 2022. I have to say it felt very one-sided. It felt like the questions were very easy and very light. It also felt like the interviewer was leading Casey a lot of the time and almost giving her the answers within the question when it was asked like somebody else. and it just felt very one-sided in fact Nicole. Nancy Grace actually spoke out on this because she was asked to interview Casey and here's what she said executives at Peacock aren't dumb they they knew this was coming so why do it it is the only reason they would do this they're in a business they clearly know that there's going to be an audience and that they're gonna this is gonna be profitable for them because they're gonna make money. That's why they're doing it. And it's on us whether we watch it or not. And I would like to point out that I was contacted by this group when the director was still working on it to have a sit down with Tottenham Casey Anthony under these conditions. And I said, absolutely not. Because when I learned, I couldn't ask the question I wanted. I couldn't control what was happening. No way because she's going to do exactly what we predict. She's going to have softball questions and lie her way through it with no one to test her, such as under cross-examination. And this is a way for her to get fame. And she's a hard variety, woman. She's a she hard woman. Anymore, and probably money. Now, Peacock may say, oh, we're not paying for an interview. Again, BS. You guys have heard of licensing fees for photos. Sure, we're not going to pay you for your interview, but... I'll pay you 20 grand for a picture of Kelly. Yeah, that's how that works. I can tell you this, they're going to make a mint. Um, I mean, is it distasteful? Yes. Um, what, what concerns me is that we are not learning anything. There's no furtherance of the truth. There's no furtherance of justice. She should be in jail. This is just, in my opinion, a money and fame grab. And Peacock's going right. I also felt like in this interview, in the portions in which she was sitting down and doing the interview head on, almost like the confessional type look, it felt too rehearsed to me. And it almost felt theatrical a little bit oh. through her facial expressions. It felt like she was only showing emotion and true emotion when she was defending herself and when she was defending herself for being blamed for Kaylee being gone and being so a killed. And every other time she was talking, it just felt like through her facial expressions and her mannerisms that it was rehearsed and that it wasn't genuine. And that I had something to say to make my daughter proud, but also to honor her properly. And this is part of that. I still don't know. What? What happened to Kaylee? I know what I'm afraid of. I know what eats at me at night. I know what eats at me day after day. This does look theatrical. Because I know what I lived through. But I'm still defending the fact that I didn't hurt her. I live it every single day. And no one can ever tell me I should just get over the fact that my daughter isn't here and I've been blamed for her being gone. So Casey starts off this documentary by saying, I lied a lot more than I ever told the truth because the truth was too painful. She says that all of her lies always had an antidote of truth hidden within them. For example, Zanny the Nanny, who we all know about at this point. Mm -hmm. She says that Zanny was in fact a real person, was a true nanny, but that she was never her nanny. Never. 
She also says that that apartment, the complex that she took the police to when they were going to her place of work and then to where she dropped Kaylee off last at Zanny's house, that was in fact Casey's best friend's apartment complex. But Zanny never lived there. So again, a sliver of truth hidden within the but lie. why? When I lied during this and even prior to, there was always at least some part of the truth. So if you lie, how do we know that you're lying there compared to there? Like if you're telling the truth about lying, are we really going to think that your truth is the truth or is the truth a lie and the lie is a truth? Why not just tell the truth to begin with? And then you don't have to worry about all these lies. That was a part of the lie. And she said that this was the case for all of her hey. lies. And she admitted to lying a lot. And I'll just say, I feel like this pattern is still a little bit the same based on this documentary. She says she is extremely truthful now, so much so to a fault. She's honest to a fault. She's very blunt. She never lies. But there's things that I saw throughout this documentary where it felt very much like a pattern she admitted to having where she hid a little bit of truth within the lie. And we'll, you'll understand that as we continue. Okay. And what is your relationship to truth and lying today? I'm a little too honest. I'm blunt. I'm direct. Almost painfully so. I want to start with the 911 call and some of her behavior immediately. She didn't report her daughter missing for 31 days. She went partying. She went all... If I lost my kid for 30 minutes, 30, 15, 30 seconds, I am freaking out. I'm a, a very overprotective dad. I'm not going to lie. Like when my kids go outside, I need to know where they are. So for her to be like, yeah, I don't know where she was. I went partying and all that stuff. Yeah, I don't, I don't believe it following it in this 911 call she says that she was the last one to see Kaylee and that she had left her with her nanny in this call Cindy Casey's mother sounds absolutely hysterical and frantic yet when Casey gets on the phone she doesn't mm -hmm. and it isn't like she just Remember doesn't that. sound frantic or hysterical and sounds maybe numb or very stoic she doesn't sound that way either she sounds irritated almost and this is something that raised red flags way back when this case first started. And hearing it back again, it just reminded me, no, she sounds irritated here. And we're going to talk more about this in a second. But she says that she was in survival mode. And that's why she doesn't sound like herself. But 911, what's your emergency? <laughs> I called a little bit ago. The deputy said, I found out my granddaughter has been taken. She has been missing for a month. We're talking about a three-year-old little girl. My daughter finally admitted that the baby's in the store. I need to find her. Your daughter admitted that your ba the baby is where? That the babysitter took her a month ago. My daughter's been looking for her. I told you my daughter was missing for a month. I just found her today, but I can't find my granddaughter. And she just admitted to me that she's been trying to find her herself. There's something wrong. I found my daughter's car today, and it smells like there's been a dead body in the damn car. Okay, what is the three-year-old's name? Kaylee. C-A-Y-L-E-E, -E, Anthony. Kaylee Anthony? Yes. How long has she been missing for? I have not seen her since the 7th of June. Is your daughter there? Yes. Can I speak with her? Okay, Santa's here. They want to talk to you. Answer your question. Hello? Hello? Yes. Can you tell me what's going on a little bit? I'm sorry? Can you tell me a little bit what's going on? My daughter's been missing for the last 31 days. And you know who has her? I know who has her. I've tried to contact her. I actually received a phone call today now from a number that is no longer in service. I did get to speak to my daughter for about a moment, about a minute. Who has her? Do you have a name? Her name is Zenaida Fernandez. During her first call with her parents while she's in jail, she says to them, you guys are only worried about Kaylee. And her yeah. says that she was worried that maybe Casey was confused. Maybe she was sick. And Casey says to her, hey, I saw you on the news, nice cameo. With her behavior in the 911 call itself, then her behavior in these calls, I'm a professional, I can't clinically diagnose anybody, exactly. but it's my opinion that she is very narcissistic here. Her two-year-old daughter is missing at this point. And 
all she is saying to her parents in that first call is, you guys are only worried about Kaylee. Hey, nice cameo on the news. Making herself the victim in all this. Like, why aren't you worried about she's me? Why are you worried victim. about Kaylee? Hi, because she's your two-year-old daughter. She's the victim. That's where the worry should be placed. Yeah. So everything just feels very disjointed here. And it doesn't sound like somebody who's in survival mode. It sounds like somebody who's worried that she isn't being looked at as the victim. The correction center. Doesn't that sound like somebody else? NK? Casey? Mom. Hey, sweetie. The, the thing, too, is it's scary as they both look very, very similar. Well, I just saw your nice little cameo on TV. How come everybody's saying that you're not upset, that you're not crying, that you show no caring of where Taylor is at all? I'm not sitting here fucking crying every two seconds because I have to stay composed to talk to detectives, to make other phone calls, to do other things. I can't sit here and be crying every two seconds like I want to. I can't. So she says that she hopes everything could be okay, and she actually did tell her that Kaylee could be somewhere familiar, but that she didn't know. And as it turns out, Kaylee was found somewhere familiar at the park that Casey used to always hang out at during their teen years on Suburban Drive. So again, a piece of truth hidden in the lie. What's your gut telling you right now? Well, you have the same me that she's okay. Okay, and your gut tells you that she's close or some she's she's hiding. She's, she's not far. I know in my heart she's not far. I can feel it. Okay. Narcissists don't care. Okay. Oh, my God. Now, during the time when Kaylee was missing in those 31 days, Casey was out partying, didn't act like she had a child, didn't act like she had a child missing, and had she no care in the back. world by the looks of it. We all know she got that tattoo on her back shoulder that read The Good Life. It was translated to The Good Life. In this documentary, she explains that the reason she got that tattoo was as an F you to her parents. She says that I got that to them saying, you know, this is an F you to them, almost like an ironic kind of symbol because her life was so tortured and tragic. And so I got this tattoo in rebellion of them. And she covered up her tattoo with a symbol of growth and rebirth which she proudly shows in the very beginning of this documentary. So it's almost kind of like she changed the narrative of not only the entire story, but also of why she got the tattoo. So once again, she says that she was in survival mode this entire time. The time that Kaylee was missing during those 31 days, all the way until she was found, and then even the weeks after Kaylee was found. She says that she was just doing what her dad told her to do, which we are going to come back to later. Again, it's my opinion that the behavior in the 911 call and the jail calls do not sound like somebody who is in survival mode. It sounds like somebody who is irritated, irritated that they're getting caught, who is concerned that they're going to further get caught, and they're worried about covering their tracks. They're worried about it their doesn't self sound like survival mode. Let's talk a little bit about not the alibi, but the fictitious story of where Kaylee was while she was missing for those 31 days. When Casey's dad, George, had his initial interview, he said that Casey called him and said that she was taking Kaylee to Zanny the nanny's house because she had Look to go her. to work. That this phone call took place well before they even realized that Kaylee was missing and that she had said she was dropping her off there. Lee Anthony, Casey's brother, testified that Casey also provided this same story of Kaylee's disappearance when she was out free on bond in August of 2008. Smiling. According to his testimony, Casey told him that the nanny, Zanny, met her at a park in Orlando and held her down with the help of her sister. This was the first time that testimony was given as to how this alleged babysitter actually kidnapped Kaylee. So her well, brother Lee that? says that Zanny helped hold Casey down with Zanny's sister, that they met at the park in Orlando and then they abducted Kaylee. So Casey kept this story going, not only from back when Kaylee first disappeared, not report missing, disappeared, but all the way until after Kaylee's body was recovered, a story that she made up not her father. She made up the story that she dropped Kaylee off at Zanny's. She told that to her father. She also told that to her mother. She then said that Zanny kidnapped Kaylee. She kept this Keeps story changing. going, something she created, not her dad. And she kept this going well after Kaylee's body was recovered. Throughout the documentary, Casey goes on this 
tour of sorts where she goes to all of these different landmarks that were key in the investigation and in the trial. She goes to her fictitious workplace. She goes to the apartment that Zanny apparently lived in. She goes to her childhood home. She goes to all these places. So when she gets to the apartment complex that she told police that Zanny lived at and where she dropped Kaylee off, she acts mad in this documentary. She points to the apartment almost mad being like, that's where Zanny allegedly lives. This is the apartment she lives at, which you made that lie up. You're the one that said she lived there and she didn't. So why are you acting mad now being like, that's the apartment. That's the one she allegedly lived at. Hi, no. Why are you mad? You made that lie up. Nobody else did. And you picked that apartment complex because you were familiar with it because your best friend lived there. This was the place that Zenaida Gonzalez or Zanny the Nanny, as she was referred to, was allegedly living. She also says that she never had a nanny, period, and that she had never used Zanny. Yet, she also says in this interview that she did want a night out with her friends. So she told her mom that she dropped Kaylee off with Zanny, but that she took Kaylee with her. The whole nanny thing started because there were times where I wanted to have a night with my friends, but I also wanted to have my daughter there with me because I knew my father was going to be home. So I told my mom, I'm gonna drop her off with my friend, Zanny. Now in that statement, there's a few things to unpack. Once again, it shows that she's the one who created the lie, not her father, about Kaylee going with Zanny, saying, I wanted a night out with friends, I wanted a party, so I told my mom I dropped her off with Zanny. She's the root of the lie, not her father. But when you look at it again, it also sounds like a half-truth that she says she so often did in the past. I definitely think she did want a night out with friends. I think she wanted to party. Oh well, yeah, she, of course she, she did. she didn't drop her off with Zanny. I think she got rid of Kaylee so that she wouldn't cramp her style. I don't think she brought Kaylee with her. I think it was one more half-truth packed she into a lot. So let's Kaylee. talk about when Casey got pregnant with Kaylee. She says that she was assaulted. Now, this very well may be true. I'm not in position to say it did or didn't happen, not at all. Casey did tell her mom when she got pregnant who the father was, but she never mentioned it being forced sex. She also never mentioned it being forced sex to her defense team. And instead, she just said that she will never provide the father's identity and will take it to the grave. Which initially in the trial had a lot of people speculate if Casey's brother Lee or her father George was Kaylee's biological father due to accusations of abuse there. I never heard that. Both the brother and the father were ruled out via DNA. So when she says that this is how she got pregnant in the documentary, it's inconsistent with her past claims that she made to everybody else, which again, very well could be true. And maybe she had too much shame to admit to it until now. But what I will say struck me as odd when she tells the story of what happened to her that night. She says that she was drugged and remembers absolutely nothing. Then she says when she woke up, I was thinking, how did this happen? Why did this happen? She never makes a comment about who did this. Or where's your daughter? I woke up and wondered why did this happen? How did this happen? Who did this? It never was a question about who did this. But she says she doesn't remember anything from that night. So she wouldn't even remember who had done this. So it indicates to me that she knows who got her pregnant. Like she told her mom. Maybe she did know the person she had sex with, like she told her mom and so many other people. And if she did, maybe it wasn't forced as she sang. So switching gears to the day that Kaylee died. According to Casey and in this document, it says that her dad, George, woke her up at 9 a.m. shaking her. She says she was taking a nap. She wasn't feeling well. Kaylee was taking a nap with her. They were in her bedroom watching TV. And then at 9 a.m., he storms into her bedroom and starts shaking her, waking her up, asking where Kaylee is. So they, she jumps out of bed confused, and they start searching the house and searching the property. Then while looking in the backyard before getting back inside, she says that George approached her, and he was holding Kaylee. That Kaylee was wet and heavy and appeared lifeless. She also was saying that her dad was yelling at her, screaming as he was holding Kaylee, this is your fault, you caused this, yet in the next breath says, don't worry, she's going to be okay. So she says he approaches her holding Kaylee being, this is your fault, this is all your fault, you caused this, but don't worry, I'm going to take care of it, it's going to be okay, which feels like a very... What I think I remember from this is that they said that the dad apparently disposed of Kaylee, which was a whole other turn in itself, but... 
I can't remember vaguely about this case since it was back in 2011. So that's why we're continuing and starting this uh, rabbit hole of this murder case. Dark change? It <coughs> came in hot, but could happen. But let's talk about the inconsistencies here. Casey says that Kaylee would never leave the bedroom without telling her. Even if she had to go to the bathroom, she would never, ever get out of bed and leave the bedroom without telling me. I just want to know, what two-year-old it ha- what two-year-old has the mental responsibility and wherewithal to tell their parent that they're leaving the room to go to the bathroom or their plan to leave a- or their plan to leave a room without just doing it? And that's assuming that Kaylee was already potty trained at this young age. What two-year-old? I've never seen one. If you have one, let me know. And my two-year-old, or my now three-and-a-half-year-old, is pretty dang smart. I can tell you right now. My son's smart, but I guarantee you he's not going to sit there. Dad, I'm going to the bathroom. Dad, I'm going to go wash my hands. Dad, I'm going to leave the room. He's just going to leave. He's 10 years old. 11 years old. He's not going to tell me. But what two-year-old is waking you up being like, Mommy, Mommy, I'm going to leave the room now. I'm going to go and play. I'm gonna, I am gonna. have to go to the bathroom. I'll be back. A two-year-old generally just kind of gets up and does it. They aren't responsible yep. enough to notify you of that. So her placing all of this responsibility on Kaylee Aren't and Kaylee? saying how it was so out of character for her to just leave and get up and go out of the room doesn't quite sit right. No. She would never even leave my room without telling me even if she had to go to the bathroom. She'd never just leave me there. For a two-year-old, it's kind of unheard of to be She knew trained. she wasn't allowed to just be I mean, in possible, the house by herself. But... And then remember, she said that her dad came up to her screaming, holding Kaylee, yet that he was also comforting. Now, here's my question. If she was wet and if she had drowned like it appeared she had, why was there duct tape when Kaylee was found? Which in this documentary, Casey even says she does not think that Kaylee drowned and how the ladder to the above ground pool wasn't even there. There are too many scenarios of what could have happened, but her drowning in the pool is not one. It's not possible. In most scenarios, it would be plausible. Not in this one. The ladder wasn't on the pool. It's the only way in or out for her or for me. So we're going to come back to why Casey says Kaylee was wet in a little bit. This same day, which is the day of Kaylee's disappearance, the day everything goes down, the day of reckoning, June 16th, 2008. This is also the day of the infamous Google searches. Google searches that took place the very day Kaylee went missing. Here we go. Casey was at her parents' house, as confirmed by cell phone pings, when a search was typed in at 2.51 p.m. The search was misspelled, and it was for suffocation. Seconds later, the computer user was pointed to a website with writing that suggested poison yourself and then follow it up with suffocation by placing a plastic bag over the head. And we know that Kaylee was found with a plastic bag. One minute after that, a MySpace account was accessed by this user. Now, Casey was the only person in the house who used MySpace, and she was very active on MySpace. Then, According to Pings, Casey left the house at 4 p.m. to go to Tony's house. Initially, the searches were blamed on Cindy, Casey's mother, and I think Cindy even took accountability saying, you know, I did the one for chloroform. I was trying to search chlorophyll, and it came up chloroform, but her time card at work showed that she was working during the time of those searches. Oh! So quickly debunked. So now, today... And back then even, now that we know Cindy did not make those searches, Who did? now in this documentary, Casey needed to find another excuse, another scapegoat, another person who could have done those searches. So in the documentary, she says that her dad, George, made those searches. But here's the discrepancy. At 2.49 p.m. that afternoon, George left for work, and he was confirmed to be at work at 3 p.m., his workplace was approximately 10 minutes from his house. Then at 3.02 p.m., George called the house landline. So Casey is trying to say that George made those searches at 2.51 p.m. to 2.53 p.m., no. then raced to work, got there by 3 p.m., and then called the landline. That would make sense if he were the Flash. Okay, sure, yeah. he raced <laughs> maybe. But also, why would he log into her MySpace yeah. or her photo bucket? I guarantee yeah. at his age, no offense to the older generation, but a lot of the older generation, one, they don't like using Facebook. Back then, didn't like MySpace because social media was, I mean, 
satanic pretty much because they wanted, I mean, they use it mostly for pictures. They use it more for memories and stuff like that, but they're not going to use it like the younger generation back then when I was first starting back in 2006 and seven, I think it was where I had a MySpace and stuff like that. So those two parents, I guarantee did not use MySpace. I guarantee that was Kaylee or Casey. Just throwing that out there. More importantly, why would he Google suffocation if five and a half hours earlier he was holding Kaylee's wet, lifeless body? Why would he need to Google a method of murder after she was already dead? Make it make sense. These searches are real, and there's an interview where the defense says that it was the state's fault for never bringing those up in the trial. If they had, this might have all gone down very differently. She'd probably be arrested. And the defense even admits that the searches were real and they were floored that it wasn't entered into the trial. Jose, the defense attorney, the lead defense attorney, even looked smug in this interview when discussing it. It could shake up the Casey Anthony case last year. Anthony, you may recall, was found not guilty of murdering her daughter, Kaylee. I don't get it. Now her lawyer tells our Orlando station, WKMG, that the prosecution failed to bring up key computer evidence. It seems to show that Anthony did a web search on how to kill and poison and suffocate on the same afternoon that her daughter was murdered. Holy crap. We were waiting for the state to bring it up, and when they didn't, we were kind of shocked. Why they didn't bring it up or how it happened, you'd have to ask them about it. I don't understand how no one ever knew about this evidence. Uh, we were keeping it close to the vest and, and ready to uh, counterpunch uh, in the trial, and it never came up. The sheriff's office admits it failed to give prosecutors that information. made, And then after that day, Kaylee was not seen alive ever again, and her body was found six months later. Now, this part here is just my opinion as I'm talking through it. If George was confirmed to be at work at 3 p.m., and Casey was still at the house until 4 p.m., and she made those searches at 2.50 while Kaylee was with her at the house, it's my belief that she probably did something to Kaylee between 3 and 4 o'clock, put Kaylee in her trunk, which we know smelled of decomposition, and then Mm -hmm. drove to Tony's house. And at that point, she was not a mother anymore and was able to live her life the way she wanted. That is just my opinion. She's right on it. Because based on forensic, based on evidence, they believe the day that Kaylee did die was June 16th, even though she wasn't recovered until several months later. So as we talk more about Casey shifting this entire murder onto her dad, Let's get into the other bombshells she was dropping in this documentary. She says that her dad assaulted her from ages 8 to 12 years old. She says that she started having flashbacks of these memories as she was sitting in jail, that she had suppressed them and that they were starting to now come to the surface. It is possible, but it's more likely in my opinion that this is when she started concocting a story with her defense team and having these flashbacks and memories because it was part of the narrative that they were going to use to get her to go free, which worked. She also says that she thinks her dad was assaulting Kaylee. Now, I am not an expert, so I am only speaking to my experience with the cases that I've covered Mm -hmm. and survivors that I have spoken with. But it is pretty rare that an abuser goes from being attracted and targeting someone in the prepubescent years 8 to 12 and suddenly shifts to somebody two years old. More commonly, peds target a certain age group as that is what their attraction and fixation is on. There are certain markers, there are certain things about the hormones, certain things they're looking for that they stay within that range. Rarely does a ped target such a broad age range. Again, anything is possible, But it's my opinion this is not the case. I agree with you. It's my opinion that she came up with this story as a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. Saying, saying, hey, my dad did this to me, or I'm going to say my dad did this to me. So he did it to Kaylee, too. He had to have done it to Kaylee, too. Let's just say he did it to both of us. Because she also had to create a motive for George to kill Kaylee. So if assault was off the table, what would the motive have been? It had to work. So I think she looked at it as a one-size-fits-all approach and said, this is what we're going to say, or her defense team said, this is what we're going to say, and they ran with it. Because very rarely, in reality, 
is that how it works? Mm-hmm. Do they have such a broad age range? It's not he did this to this person, so he'll do it to every person he comes across. That is not how it works. It goes way deeper and way more psychological and performance issues with certain things. Like it goes deeper than that. So here's what Casey says that she thinks happened. She believes her dad was forcing himself on Kaylee and that he might have accidentally killed her while smothering her with a pillow so that she couldn't fight him off. As Casey says, he did with her in her youth between 8 to 12 years old. So Casey had said that when all of this was happening to her when she was 8 to 12 years old, that any time she was resistant or said she didn't want to, her dad would smother her with a pillow until she passed out, and then he would force himself on her. And she said that this happened repeatedly, multiple times. So she's saying that she thinks this is what happened to Kaylee, and that he smothered her with a pillow so she couldn't fight him off. Now maybe that's true. But again, and I'm not an expert, but going back to cases I've covered and things I've seen and research I've done, generally two-year-olds and young children in general are the perfect target because they trust these individuals. Because when this is inflicted by a family member, these kids are so young and they trust this person and love this person. There's a special place in hell for those kind of people so much that they aren't resistant because they don't know what's going on they don't know what's happening they think it's okay they're being told they're safe they're being told it's okay and so unfortunately they don't fight back many of the times which is why it makes them such easy targets and why we have so many cases like this going on right now and why it happens so often to kids so young because they are unfortunately easy targets so to assume that a two-year-old has the mental emotional and physical strength to fight off her grown man attacker feels like a miracle if it's true but it feels a little far-fetched to me again the reason shit like this happens to kids so often is because they're able to get away with it because the kids don't fight back they don't tell anyone they don't do anything so to say that this two-year-old little girl had not only the mental and emotional capacity to know what was going on with she wrong, trusted but to their killer. vocalize it and to say no, but also to push him off her to where he had to smother this two-year-old with a pillow so she couldn't fight him off feels very much, again, just like a one-size-fits-all. Like, I'm going to say that this is probably the reason because this is how it happened to me or this is how I said it happened to me. It doesn't equate. It doesn't make sense. And implying that little Kaylee had this advanced mental, emotional, and physical capabilities just like she did with the leaving the room she would never tell me she would leave the room she would never leave the room without telling me she would never leave the room to go to the bathroom without telling me wrong acting as though kaylee was much more mature and older than she truly was but let me know what you guys think and if you have seen or heard of this before but in all of the cases i've covered and anything i've ever researched i've never seen someone that age even a few years older than that be somebody who is so aware of what's happening to where they're fighting their family member off of them at again at such a young age but tell me what you think so casey claims as they were searching for kaylee george brought kaylee's wet body over to her and sure and assured her that kaylee would be okay before then taking kaylee to an unknown location so my question is why was kaylee wet if she was suffocated by a pillow why was she wet casey thinks that it was to cover up the suffocation that the pool story was to cover up what he did. But you'd be able to tell by so water in the lungs. So did he move and then hide Kaylee's body for 31 days after that? Oh and did gosh, he hide her in your days. trunk where we know it smelled of decomposition oh. to frame you? She says that she thinks maybe Kaylee was still alive when she saw her when she was wet and that her dad took Kaylee for that entire 31-day period and was assaulting her for those 31 days. Yet her mother never saw Kaylee in those 31 days. So did he have her housed somewhere off site? Where was she that nobody ever saw her? Also, experts said that her car pretty much smelled the entire time that Kaylee was missing, indicating that she had died very early on into the 31 days of being missing. So was her dad's plan to put Kaylee's body in her trunk and frame her the entire time? Make it make sense. Let's also go back to those Google searches for a minute, assuming that he did make them. Was Kaylee murdered by the pillow during the assault? Or was he trying to Google how to kill her? Which one is it? Casey tried to blame the Google searches on George, yet now she was saying that she thinks that because he used the pillow to suffocate Kaylee. But now he was Googling how to murder her? Which one is it? And again, even if the pillow story is true, he woke Casey up at 9 a.m. 
and then they found Kaylee shortly after that. So if that's what happened, why Doesn't five and sense. a half later would he be Googling how to kill her and then log into Casey's MySpace and photo bucket In nine minutes. and then race to work and then call the house? Make it make sense. It I doesn't. will say there is something about George that I can't put my finger on that doesn't sit entirely yeah. right with me. It's I don't awkward. believe the story Casey is trying to sell and I don't think he's necessarily guilty of everything she's accusing him of. But there is something that does not sit right with me about I think him. He's, uh, I think that maybe he did help. I think he probably is uh, an accessory to decom or um, getting rid of Kaylee. Um, I don't think he did it, but I think uh, Casey did it, caused the, the murder. She freaked out, found out that, yep, Kaylee's gone. Went to her dad. Dad, I need help. Um, I or I wouldn't say I accidentally, but I, I took Kaylee away from the world. And they try to figure out a game plan to resolve this. Help Casey hide the body. I think maybe he did know more. I think it's possible that Casey killed Kaylee accidentally rather than intentionally. And then she no went to her dad for help. I think that's all possible. See, that's what I just said. But I think it's more likely that Casey wanted her freedom. She wanted to party. She wanted to be young. Like she said in those Facebook messages of, oh, I'm tied down with my kid. Or, oh, the kid's still here. Or whatever she was saying. So I think she got rid of Kaylee then lied to everyone about everything because she didn't want to get caught. Then she got caught, and she had to curate a new story with her defense team. And that's where this came to fruition. Jesus and Casey crying. really doubled down on this allegation and George doing this to Kaylee and really pushed the abuse allegations with the funeral footage and her dad's speech. Now, there are things that he said in the speech that kind of give me cringe or like the ick factor. Nothing that I feel like implied he was actually forcing Kaylee to do these things, but still things that I just kind of felt like, oh, that feels weird. Like when he was like, oh, she was, I just miss when, miss when she was out playing and would come up to me in the smell of her sweet sweat. Like things like that, that I was kind of like, oh, that's gross. Like, I don't okay, know if I said that, nothing that would imply like, oh my God, because you said that you must be a peed. But in this documentary, Casey was watching the footage and narrating it as though he was standing at the podium telling everybody, I abuse my granddaughter. The dramatics with her reaction and the things she was saying during this was like she was trying to convince the viewers of this documentary that that's what he was doing. I stand here today proud to be the grandfather of Kaylee Marie Anthony, who not only meant the world to me, but meant the world to my family and so many of you that never got a chance to actually hug her, smell her hair, smell the sweet sweat when she came in from outside. Are you fucking kidding To hear her call me Jojo, I miss that kiss on the cheek, that special hug that I tell everyone it's the so The sweet great sweat part, that's kind of creepy. But to get a hug from a small child, that gives me energy like you couldn't imagine. That's not normal. Nothing about that is fucking normal. You're outright telling the world that you're a. Jesus Christ. I'm not going to say how much I'm going to miss things that I won't be able to do with her because someday I'll be able to hold her hand again in God's heaven. I'll be able to take her in wagon rides. I'll be able to kiss her. I'll be able to smell her again. The Another smell thing is kind of weird. The documentary is George's motive for testifying, and it's brought into question in this documentary. George had been telling the media that what happened to Kaylee was an accident and how much he loves his daughter, Casey. Yet he was also the star witness for the prosecution who was seeking the death penalty. So it had a lot of people wonder why he was trying so hard to secure the death penalty for his daughter. Could it be resentment for Casey murdering his granddaughter who he loved so much? Sure. Did he blame her? Could be. Or was he trying to shift so the blame onto Casey to cover his tracks because he was guilty? 
And that's what the documentary is trying to push a little bit. So what do you guys think? Now, remember how in the beginning I mentioned how Casey said that she was in survival mode and saying that her dad, George, was the puppet master and told her to lie and that she was just doing everything he told her to do. I call bullshit because George is a former cop. So there is no way that he would tell Casey to make up lies that would so quickly be proven to be false and get caught in, such as the nanny, such as working at Universal Studios, all of these things that were so easily disproven with it after being with it the police no for literally an hour. All. If your dad orchestrated this and you were in survival mode and you were doing everything he told you to do and saying everything he told you to say, he would come up with a better cover story and lie given his profession Mm -hmm. not something that would be able to be so quickly disproven like a teenager thought of it not to mention you said on multiple occasions that you're the one that came up with the zanny the nanny story so there's that as well now she makes it a point in this documentary to show her anger with her father and how she's strong now she's going to call him out for who he is she's going to put him on blast for what he did and she even says that there's no statute of limitations in florida for these crimes so my question is if she feels so strongly about this and she wants him to be held accountable why isn't she going after him legally whether it's criminally or civilly i mean surely there's not enough evidence to go after him criminally because i don't believe there's a confession anywhere that we know of certainly there's no forensic evidence to make this you know a big criminal matter but she could definitely go after him civilly, if not to make a point in all of this. But she's not doing any of that. And my guess is because she knows that her story would crumble once she is in a courtroom. The total tone for this documentary, my takeaway from it, was that Casey just kept making herself the perpetual victim. victim. The only thing that she was taking accountability for was the fact that she was a liar and lied multiple times. She said several times throughout the documentary, yes, I lied about that. Yes, I was a liar. Oh, I can't wait to watch it. acknowledging it. Which, yeah, we already know that. That's already been proven a decade ago. Tell us something new. But she wasn't taking any accountability for anything else Tell us that you killed her. Instead, she just continuously, in my opinion, was making herself the victim. The victim of her father's, the victim of the forced pregnancy with Kaylee, the victim of the public's opinion, the victim of survival mode and being forced to lie, the victim, the victim, the victim, no accountability. I also Feel think sorry she's now for me. 10 years to give the performance of a lifetime and to get her story straight. And in my opinion, this just made the public hate her more. Now, I don't like her. I know there are a lot of conflicting opinions out there, and I'm sure a lot of people still haven't watched this, but based on the feedback I'm seeing now, more people disagree with this than actually look at her and be like, oh my yep. gosh, I believe her now. I don't think she was guilty. I don't think anybody but believes that her. That may sway as more people watch it. Who knows? Let me know what you guys think. But as I said, the tone to me was that she kept making herself the victim in all this. Never once was she taking accountability and saying, here's why I lied about Zanny. Here's why I said this. Here's why I did that. And I just want to remind you about that Nancy Grace statement and the questions. Nancy said the reason she wouldn't do this is because she didn't have control over what questions were asked. No questions were being asked that she's a hard questioner answer to or couldn't have the answer to. And this interview too felt very one sided, as I mentioned. The interviewer never was pushing back on answers that Casey would give. They weren't really asking any of the tough questions. It felt very one-sided. So, Casey, I'm just saying, hit Nancy up. If you really have nothing to hide, I like and if to you are the one. epitome of uh, truth interview. now and honesty now, and you are so honest and so blunt and so direct to a fault, hit Nancy up. Let her ask the hard questions if you have nothing to hide. Then let's see how that goes. I want to see then that interview. <laughs> so, guys, whether you've seen the documentary yourself or not, comment below now that we're wrapping this up. Has your position on this changed? Do you still feel she is guilty? Do you feel she's not guilty? (laughs) I think think she's more guilty by watching this. And I'm going to watch the the videos tonight um, uh, while I'm in bed and so forth like that. And I'll definitely tell you tomorrow in the next video that we post um, about if it's the father or the grandfather or the daughter or whatever have you. But there's definitely some odd irregulars or irregularities with the grandfather. I mean, not what I would sit there and be like, oh, I missed the sweet sweat. But I would miss the hugs. I'd miss the hand holding. I would miss the the cute little sayings that she would say or 
and I guarantee she probably had some cute little phrases and and little mannerisms to her, but I wouldn't say the whole f- freaky sweat part. That that's a little creepy, but I mean everybody describes things differently. But I wouldn't say he's a pedo. Um, but again, I could be wrong. What do you guys think? Is about the father, the grandfather, and what do you think about Casey? Please let me know. Has anything changed? Have you watched the documentary and has your opinion changed? I'm about to. Where do you stand with this? Also, if you haven't watched the documentary and you want to watch it, but you don't have Peacock, there is a YouTube account that has uploaded all three episodes. So I will link that in the comment section below. We'll see how long it stays up until they get a strike and get shut down. But you could always head there to watch it as well. So let me know what you guys think about all this in the comments below. Do you think she's being truthful? Do you think she's innocent? Do you believe her story? Or do you think that she just fabricated all of this? Because she's trying to gain public sympathy, thinking that we're in a just like moment Nicole. in time where Me Too is so big that she thinks the public will have sympathy for her and be more likely to believe her. Or is this the reality? And was no. the majority of the world wrong in what they thought about her? I'm just saying, I'm going to leave it right there for you guys, but I think this is a good case. Just like uh, Nicole Kessinger, she came forward after 31 days and she's like, Oh, I got to I got to do something about this. They're going to, they're going to find her. And then find, find somehow I think that the, the grandfather might be involved because she freaked out, didn't know how to dispose of Kaylee and the father grandfather helped, but then he wanted to make it look like he was, he was innocent. But I do still think to this day that Casey Anthony is the cause and demise of her, um, late daughter which is very unfortunate because that little girl deserved the world and unfortunately the mom was not fit or mature enough to do so um i wonder how old kaylee is or casey is now let me see how old casey anthony is how old Thirty-seven years old. She's she's right at my age. I'm thirty-five. So this happened in eleven years. So technically, Kaylee would have been thirteen, fourteen, pretty much the same age as my child because my child was born in two thousand twelve. So just a little shy of uh, Kaylee. But again, we're just opening up this Pandora's box of Casey uh, Anthony. Let me know down below, Casey Anthony victim or murderer. And we'll see you guys in the next video. So please take care. Keep it safe. Keep it real. And as always, keep nerding on. And we will see you guys next time.